Hi there, I'm your host and current animation student at Sheridan College, Terry Ibell, and welcome to the podcast. Today I'm very excited to have multiple primetime Emmy Award winning and seasoned animation professional Ryan Quincy here with me. Ryan began his career as a stop-motion animator at Mad TV before moving on to produce South Park for over 14 years, where he received both his primetime Emmys. He's also created two original shows, Out There for IFC and Future Worm for Disney, and now he's working on a third original show for Netflix, which he's going to talk a little bit about in today's episode. So, Ryan, how's it going? Great, Terry. Thanks for having me on the show. This is, uh, this is exciting. Yeah, well, well, thank you so much for being here. Um, now, my first question is, and it's kind of how I always start the podcast, is what got you interested in the animation industry and how did you get your start? Um, well, I, I grew up in a really small town in Nebraska in the 70s and 80s and uh, some of the 90s, so the dark ages, you know. <laughs> and uh, my dad took me to, uh, when I was like four years old, he took me to the screening of the original King Kong from the 30s. And ever since then, it was I was just sort of like inspired or captivated by just the magic of, of King Kong and, you know, how they moved. And it, it felt like magic to me. And how was that done? And, and ever since then, it was just sort of like consume or soak up everything whether it was like godzilla movies or you know star wars comic books all that stuff the muppets uh, i just kind of took it all in because it was just it, it was so um it was just so exciting to me um so that's really where in the saturday morning cartoons and, and and all that stuff back when they only showed cartoons on saturdays so um that was really where i really got into uh animation i wasn't really sure how it was done and as i got older i you know i didn't go to school for animation so and, and we can get into that too of kind of the the unorthodox kind of road that i kind of took to get where i am but yeah i mean i'd like to talk to you about that because uh you know some people think maybe you have to go to school and some people say you can do it on your own so i'd love to hear that perspective too oh absolutely yeah i was always um you know, very intimidated and scared of, uh, you know, film school and animation school, because then it was, you know, it's it's something I've always struggled with, was sort of this fear of failure. I want it to be perfect, and I need to go in knowing stuff. I don't want to, you know, it was a lot of stupid, you know, pride stuff. So I'm getting, working on that every day, even to this point where I've, you know, had some, you know, I guess, success in, in the in the animation you know profession but i i went to school for english and i did a had a graphic design minor and i always liked to do like draw and make movies and i was always interested in all you know writing and making my own comics and stuff so i always had an interest in in telling stories and creating stuff and drawing but i didn't you know I, again i was intimidated to you know, go to a Cal Arts or go to these, these places. Cause I, you know, I thought that would ruin me. <laughs> so I always, I, uh, would just do my own stuff. And, um, after I got out of college, I, I lived a year in Nebraska and it was just, it was, it was rough because I was trying to, I had like three jobs, like delivering pizzas and, you know, you know, office jobs, just, you know, kind of, crummy jobs and I was still trying to do at night like graphic design and, and editorial cartoons for like newspapers and it was just I, w I was miserable and I was like I should just try and go out to LA because that's sort of that's the mecca of where all the animation stuff was happening like um, the Simpsons and Rugrats and all those Nickelodeon cartoons you know Ren and Stimpy and it was a like kind of mid nineties time. So I was, um, I decided to, uh, I, I had a family friend out there that worked at uh, CBS as an entertainment attorney and, uh, contacted this, these people, sorry, my dog's, uh, barking here. If you hear him in the background, I apologize. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, I went out to LA to just, uh, again, this was a very naive 
approach, but I, I thought I would for sure, like right away, go to Disney and get hired or get hired by the Simpsons. Cause I had like a portfolio, a folder of like, you know, editorial cartoons, but it was like a rude awakening. It's like, well, where's your life drawing? Where's, you know, where's like your ball bounce and flag wave test all, you know, all this stuff that I had no idea. Cause I didn't go to animation school for any of that stuff. So it was, uh, it was a little bit of a rude awakening. So, um, that's when I started to do research and I found this school in Roland Heights. It was a high school that offered uh, really cheap animation courses for adults too, like night classes. And it's like Roland Heights is like 40 miles east of LA. And uh, so I enrolled there and it was, it was really exciting because it was like, it was uh, just like this really creative kind of lab experience where you had uh, access to, you know, uh, film equipment and, stop motion stuff I, and that's when I started to get into some stop motion stuff because there was a guy there that was kind of in the basement making his own weird like uh, uh, stop motion film so I was helping him out and uh, then he got a job at Mad TV uh, where Corky Quakenbush was doing these these shorts for them and uh, he went he went and got that job so I stayed in touch with this guy and then he called me a couple months later and said oh I'm going to New York to work on Celebrity Deathmatch. Do you want to take my place at Mad TV? And I was like, of course. You know, I don't. Again, I I didn't have a lot of knowledge about you know making armatures or fabrication or any of that. But the outfit, kind of the the studio that Corky was running was was pretty you know scrappy and do it yourself and kind of learn on the job. So it was like it was perfect. So. I went there and I was only there for like a couple months, but uh, some of the stuff that they did was, you know, like, you know, like parodies, you know, of, uh, you know, Raging Rudolph, where it's like Morton Scorsese's version of, you know, Rudolph the Red Nose, like the Rankin Bass Rudolph stuff. And uh, they did uh, Gumby Old Men and Dennis, the Menace to Society, you know, that kind of, <laughs> yeah, yeah, all the good stuff. Uh, but they did a, uh, South Park um, meets the Peanuts thing that we actually did like you know cut out construction paper and had the and filmed it the same way that Matt and Trey did back in the day for Spirit of Christmas with like the Oxbury camera you know and and so I had uh, I had that on my reel but I I need to back up a little bit because I kind of one of the key stories or one of the big like kind of serendipitous parts of my career of kind of my start was when I moved out uh, with those, with the friend from uh, CBS, um, they just happened to live right across the street from Matt and Trey, right when South Park had gotten picked up by Comedy Central in like, I want to say 90, it was probably 97 is when I came out. So, so it was total coincidence, you know, and I was like, oh, this is amazing that those guys are there. And right next door to us was, Eric Stow, who's the animation director of South Park, and uh, uh, the character Butters is based on on Eric. So, and then there were some other writers and some other based people on that worked. Life. What's that? <laughs> I didn't know he's based on a real life person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so that was that was cool to like kind of you know land there and 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 meet those guys and. They were they were fully staffed at the time, so they weren't looking for people. But it was just, you know, later on, I would when they were hiring for the movie is when I would cross paths with with them again. But uh, so, yeah, it was. Uh, it was it was really cool. And again, like coming out to L.A., it was uh, it was scary. It was very daunting. And I was like, I didn't go to school for any of this stuff. I'm I'm just going to try to find my way through this because it was a big learning experience to you know uh do these tests you know for the simpsons like i didn't know anything about the whole pipeline of how a show got made again i'm still kind of coming in with this naive you know point of view of uh it was kind of magic you know and i didn't know it was such an assembly line kind of factory sort of 
setup and there were specialized jobs, you know, there was character designers, there's layout, background design, all that stuff. And I kind of learned that like a crash course in all of that stuff when I first moved out here and was getting countless rejection letters from these studios as I was sort of finding my way. So I'm doing that and also taking classes at that, um, still taking classes at the high school in Roland Heights and then having that job at Mad TV was kind of a, the, the foundation of, of my uh, animation career. Wow. <laughs> yeah, crazy. Um, yeah. yeah, well, I'm also interested. Maybe you can kind of give the Coles notes of, of your career, kind of like the highlights and lowlights of everything you've uh, since since landing that first role to up until now, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. Well, getting that first job, um, well, definitely for Mad TV, that was like my first, you know, quotes job in animation, um, paid job, and that was exciting. But then when I got the job on the South Park movie, that was, I mean, I, I was thrilled. I couldn't believe it. And that was the other thing was I didn't have any uh, knowledge of computer animation. And that's how they were making the show. They were, you know, using Maya to, you know, recreate it looking like cutouts. And so I said that, you know, I, I didn't know computer animation they said that's okay we'll train you you know we're gonna do a two-week like training and walk you through it so it was like I was like you know there's some luck to it but there's also just kind of being you know persistent and being just open-minded and up for you know up for anything so that was definitely a big highlight was working on the movie and then being asked to go to the tv show and um, yeah, just working on South Park was a huge, you know, I hold that whole experience in high regard. I learned so much like storytelling and, and, and everything, just how fast you can put something together in a short amount of time. And, um, that was definitely a highlight being able to, yeah, the Emmys were cool, but I think just the, <laughs> the experience of, like seeing those guys work and, and working as a team and it was just exhilarating if, and you've probably seen that documentary that's out the six days to air where uh have you seen it terry i i have not but i'm gonna go watch it now yeah you should check it out it's 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 really good and just to be able to do like a 22 minute show you know cartoon in six days it's like pretty much live animating you know right. Uh, so that was just cool to be a part of that. Um, and then to get my own show on IFC was a, another highlight and working the, with the people at IFC and, uh, Fox produced it and yeah, then working at Disney, you know, that was another highlight it was, I, cause that's always the, the dream, right? Oh, go work for Disney. Right. And I never really thought that that would happen so and to yeah create a kids show and uh, another highlight now to work at netflix is another you know awesome uh, cool thing so yeah there's yeah some cool so stuff. um so being a creator of two shows and also working on south park i mean a lot of people say like oh uh i would love to be a creator of a show but what does that actually entail like what is the day-to-day -day for creating a show look like um well, I guess it all depends on what type of show it is, you know, but it's all, you know, at the end of the day, it's all, you know, you're, you're, you're putting something together, you know, as a team. So uh, with South Park, it was very much fly by the seat of your pants. Like uh, what's in the news. Okay. We can base the story around this kind of thing. And you just kind of piece it together as you go up until the, you know, the last minute, the, the 11th hour. Um, but uh, each each experience, like with Out There and Future Worm and the thing I'm doing now, it's all different. You know, they're all learning experiences, but they're all kind of different approaches. And it all depends on, you know, what the budget is of, of uh, your show and who you have to help and, you know, the support you have and uh, with South Park, what was cool is they were able to create kind of their own island, like one-stop, 
shop kind of studio where they could do everything from recording voices, editing, all the artists were in house and they created that so they could always make changes up to the last minute. And so when I went to do out there, I was used to sort of that approach and out there was more of a traditional approach where you can't keep making changes, you know, and, and tweaking stuff. You kind of have this, you have to have the storyboards kind of set in stone and you can't really deviate too much from the script. And there's, you know, and voice wise, you know, you have talent like, Oh, Fred Armisen can only do two hours and on this day. So, you know, there's, there's some more kind of restrictions to it, but, um, and, and then, yeah, it was a good learning experience. So, um, because then, uh, when I went to Disney, that was a whole different kind of approach to how they do things. So, and then you're getting into more of standards and practices and getting notes from executives and just a little more stuff to kind of, you know, contend with and, so, kind of thing, so. so, you know, having worked on South Park and then created two, well, three now original shows, what would you say are maybe like the top three keys to creating and running a successful, a successful show, like getting it up off the ground and keeping it, keeping it going then? Um, I think it's, it's key to have a good support system that you can, uh, you know, uh, empower your, you know, directors and editors and, and other folks, because you can't clone yourself to do all those things so just to be fine with letting go of some of the responsibilities because you're kind of the captain of the ship and and um i would also say just uh be open-minded to things and kind of um go with the flow there's always some unforeseen stuff that comes up and you just kind of have to either dig your heels in or you kind of pick your battles of what you want to fight against, whether it's notes from the network or, you know, something's not working in the edit and you don't have time to reanimate something. There's just, you kind of have to be, uh, think on your feet a lot of, a lot of the time. But, but the one thing I will say about creating a show is when you're coming up with an idea, just the very blue sky part of it, just make sure it's for me, this is for my experience is do something that you feel like you're because you're going to spend a lot of time in this world that you're creating and these characters and just make sure that you you like them because they are going to be you're kind of raising a kid or you're raising you know you know it's like a part of your family so you're going to be spending a lot of time with it because a lot of times i see show ideas and creators come in with something that they think that a Disney or Nickelodeon or Netflix wants to hear or see. And then you're just going to, you're going to get down the road and you're like, I don't like this. I don't like these characters. And that's just going to be, it's going to come through. So that's one of the main things I would say is just when you're making stuff, make sure you, hmm. you, you like your, uh, your characters and you want to spend time and with them in that world. Cause that's really what you're doing. You know? Gotcha. Makes sense. Um, yeah. so Maybe one last kind of technical question, but since since you know you didn't go to school and you have a more unorthodox path, a career path, looking back, what you know technical like hard skills and soft skills do you think had the biggest impact on your career? Because like for me as a student and being surrounded by classmates, like we're going to classes like life drawing, like you mentioned, and and character mm -hmm. design class and layout and stuff like that. Um, so for you not having that, uh, that, that animation school background originally, what do you think were the hard and soft skills that got you where you are now? I, th I think just uh, a good work ethic and just sort of a stubbornness to, <laughs> you know, I, it's something that I felt passionate about, you know, I really wanted to get into this you know, line of work, whether, and I had to find my way. I didn't know if I wanted to be, that's why I had to, I kind of had to trial by fire, you know, like, all right, I'll do these, I'll do this layout test. Oh, that doesn't, that seems like that would be like a factory job or I did take life drawing classes. Like, you know, and I, they're all, you know, it's all part of like the journey to figure out what you want to do or what you find most fulfilling in the profession. So, uh, I would definitely say, um, take it all in especially in school and 
and see what what fits and what doesn't and then just you know uh hopefully you'll find what you know really uh gets you going or what makes you uh fulfilled the most gotcha and and you mentioned you know uh loving your characters when you're creating a show is, has a big impact on how successful the show will be uh and you also talked about like how at south park uh you would watch the news to see what you do an episode about so uh, and I know connecting with an audience is very important. So how how much research do you do into an audience when you're when you're writing a show or creating a show? Um, do you try to like pick a, a target demographic and say, you know, we're gonna there's like a an opening for kids age nine to fifteen. Uh, we're gonna create something for them. Or is there another route? Or like I don't I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, no, that's a really good question. I think. You know, with South Park, it was definitely, you know, the the coveted, highly coveted demographic of males, 18 to 35 or whatever it is, was sort of the sweet spot. And they, um, but I don't, and as far as like making something that someone will like, I think you have to just hopefully just trust, you know, what makes you laugh, what you think it would would be compelling or would be, you know, characters or stories that you would like to hang out with or, or see, or, you know, um, I don't know. It's a, uh, it's a tough one. It's, I, I think when you start to kind of put the, the brackets around like, Oh, this is only for someone from six to nine, you know, you start to kind of, I don't know, it gets, it gets creatively kind of constrictive, you know? So I always like to approach something with like, what would everyone kind of like, you know, from cradle to grave kind of stuff. Uh, the show is from know, zero to 99 year olds. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, I know that that's tough to do with, you know, when it's an adult on an adult channel or on a, you know, a kid's channel. But with Future Worm, you know, I really wanted to do something that I could share with my kids. I have a, I have a son and a daughter and I was like doing South Park and I did out there, which were adult, you know, shows. So I couldn't really share them with the kids. Uh, so Future One was like, I want to make something for my kids, but also that adults can enjoy too. So, and it, I, I think it was probably, you know, in hindsight, I think it was probably a little too ironic for some kids and a little too wry, but, uh, I don't know. My kids liked it. So I guess I, I count that as a success. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, and, and I know that uh, Disney has, they do testing, they do audience testing and they have kids come in and what do you think about this or what would you change? And, and you get the whole Venn diagrams of what boys like and what girls like. And then you really start to get into some weird, you know, science of what they, what they do. And that, that, that side of stuff kind of turns me off, you know, about the whole, uh, making these shows, but, uh, um, yeah, like the show I'm doing now is, is, uh, the main character, the hero of it is I've never seen this as a, this character, this type of character as a hero before that, uh, so that's, what's exciting me about it. And I, I know if it's exciting me, hopefully it'll excite my friends and, you know, Hopefully there's some like-minded people out there that will be into it. So that's yeah. kind of what I go with. That's kind of my North Star. Gotcha. Well, um, I know you're working on Netflix right now, and I, I know your project is a little bit secretive. But maybe the, the first question I have is, as you're working at Netflix on something new and you're seeing a lot of other people, uh, you know, working on new animations that are going to come out, what do you think the world needs more of or the animation world needs more of in terms of young talent from artists and things? Are there things that you've noticed are kind of up and coming or that you look for, or um, I, I kind of feel like, you know, Disney's established and Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon, they have all their kind of established audiences and the shows that work for them. But Netflix is going out there and taking a risk by kind of doing a lot of trying a lot of different ideas and things. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely like a Wild West feeling at Netflix right now and there's a lot of projects that are ranging from preschool shows to adult shows and we're all all in the same building and we're all kind of you know in the same 
line for lunch and you know we're all kind of cross-pollinating with each other and it's really exciting it's really cool because you have you know people like glenn keen and craig mccracken and alex hirsch and you know just some really cool um and megan dong and uh matt lazell it's just some amazing artists there um and it's a very it's a very diverse group and i think that's what people are looking for right now it's just new stories from different people of, of different uh ethnicities and, and everything i think that's kind of what is what's exciting right now it's, it's a very diverse group of creators and uh, that will come through in their in their shows for sure so yeah um you mentioned uh like megan dong and matt lazell and they're very and yourself i mean you're all pretty uh vocal on social media especially instagram is there a role that social media is playing in all of this right now too because i i get that question a lot um from my classmates and i'm also interested in it too like uh you know how does social media play into your career as a as a as a, an animator like some of these animators are coming in with an audience already is that is that relevant does that have an impact yeah. oh absolutely i you know i i again i come from like the pre-internet pre-cell phone world and access was very limited to things but now i think social media is is amazing and you just can the accessibility to artists and around the world um i mean even going back to uh adventure time i know a lot of those folks were found on tumblr like co people that made comics and and uh and i know you know, there were some people on Wander Over Yonder that, you know, Noelle Stevenson was found on her Tumblr. And that's exciting. That's so cool to be like in, you know, in I could have been in my small, you know, room in small town, Nebraska. And, I, you know, I didn't have that access to Instagram and stuff. I think it's a really cool time right now for just exposure and that, you know, like even... I just looked at your, uh, Terry, your stop motion stuff on Instagram. It's awesome, man. And it's like, that is so cool to be able to go on there and see that and get exposed to all these different kinds of, you know, uh, artists and different media that they use. And it's, it's a cool time. It's, I think it's really important. It's, you don't really have websites anymore, you know, or business cards. It's like your Instagram or your, your Tumblr. Yeah, exactly. Now. Yeah. Well, well, thanks for checking out my stuff. <laughs> that's yeah, that's little... great, man. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, when are you going to do a stop motion show at Netflix for me? That's not... <laughs> I know. That would be cool. <laughs> um, so, yeah, let's talk a little bit more about, you know, your path to get to Netflix, because, uh, you know, I feel like it's the big mystery right now. Like, how do you how do you get a show on Netflix? You've obviously been there, done that already. So can you yeah. share kind of your path? Um, you know, did you pitch? uh did you bring a team over did they have their team or they did they find you all that stuff so how did you become a netflix creator um well there's uh mike moon who has always been a really good like uh, champion of mine and a lot of artists um he, he's the reason that i went to disney um before i did future worm he had asked me i was at the uh, pictoplasma i was speaking at a pictoplasma thing and he was there and uh he had just mentioned like oh we're thinking about um you know re we're gonna do some artist takes on mickey mouse and just do some shorts and just getting different artists would you be interested in that i was like of course yes yeah i would love to and i got to i again there's been so many times and you know in my career where i'm like why why am i <laughs> why did i get why am I in this room? I shouldn't be here. You know, it was like, it was Craig McCracken and Paul Rudish doing their takes. And I was there too. I, again, a dark horse kind of outlier. I was like, no way in hell that I was going to get this opportunity. I couldn't believe it, but I just, it was, it was amazing. So Mike, that was my first sort of uh, connection with Disney. And so they went with, you know, Paul Rudish's of course, but I was just glad to even have a chance to, you know, to draw Mickey Mouse and do a, a three minute like storyboard uh, of him. But it was a great connection. And then Mike said, you should come over and develop a show. And then when out there, didn't get a second season. I, I went over there and uh, Mike was great. And, you know, I will say this about another little bit of advice. 
um, the two times, because uh, I've had some shows not get picked up before too. I've, I've had some, a lot of failures actually, but uh, the two times that have worked the best for me with Out There and Future Worm was I was trusted to just kind of, I gave them the pitch of what the idea was, who the characters, kind of a general idea. And then they let me go off and just make it, like make Out There was three two minute shorts. And Future Worm was five, like, two-minute shorts. And that just kind of gave you, it was sort of in lieu of a pilot. It was like, here's a taste of what you're going to get. And there wasn't a lot of interference. There wasn't a lot of notes. There wasn't, you know what I mean? Because that can really kind of cut you off at the at the knees sometimes. And and you overthink things and you over-intellectualize stuff. So the most success I've had is when I'm able to go off and make something <laughs> without a lot of like notes and things. And then like, Hey, this is what I have. And then you go from there. So if you ever get the chance to do that, I would, I would definitely do that. All right. Awesome. Um, and what, what is it like working at Netflix right now? I know kind of in our pre chat, you explained it was a little bit like being in school all over again, the environment there. And you know, you're, you're in the lunch line with some other people. It sounds like yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. It's, it's wild. So, to see something. Yeah. So what is it like working in a, like what kind of team do you have? What's it like there? Oh uh, yeah. Sorry. I, uh, I was going to get to how I got to Netflix. Um, so oh, Mike sorry. Moon, yeah. Please Mike Moon had, yeah. had, had left uh, Disney and he went to Sony and uh, did some really cool stuff there. He kind of helped or he did help uh, round up a lot of the artists that worked on, um, into the spider verse and then uh he went to netflix and so he said hey i'm over at netflix if you ever have some ideas i love you know we loved working together so um yeah we just i left disney in last april and started at netflix in september because i i just came in with you know a few things it, they weren't really fully formed but enough to where I feel like Netflix is a place where there's a lot of trust and they're like, we know you've done kind of this stuff before, you know what you're doing and there's a lot of trust and that does so much for your creative psyche, you know, <laughs> to have that. But it's cool. Cause yeah, you just, um, I'm just there by myself right now. I've had a few writing brainstorm sessions with, um, some new writers and some old writers that I've worked with before. Um, and, yeah, it's really exciting. We do like monthly meetings where everyone kind of comes together and shares what they're working on and you get questions and feedback or if you get stuck on something, you know, it's just a great place to just have the resources at you know, at your disposal. So uh so yeah, it's it's really exciting and there's the other thing I think that's really cool is the the compa comparison to school is no one's really competing for a slot you're like oh they're only going to pick up two shows this year so which out of the 10 what's it going to be it's like everyone's kind of doing their own thing and there's not that added weight of uh that competition you know what i'm saying so yeah uh so yeah that it, that's that's kind of the school thing yeah everyone's kind of off doing their their films and their projects so yeah it's good. It's, yeah, can you can you share? I know it's kind of secretive right now, but what can you share about the show you're working on on Netflix right now? Um, well, it's all I can say is there's going to be it's going to be uh, serialized. It's uh, you know cliffhanger type episodes, ten episodes, the first season, um, which I haven't really done. I tried to do it a little bit in uh, Future Worm, you know, but this is going to be yeah more of like something you can really binge watch uh and it takes place uh in outer space um and yeah there's gonna <laughs> that's all i can really say it's, there's gonna be some really cool like uh worlds and aliens and things that we're gonna meet but i'm really excited about the the hero the main character which i have to keep really secret about who it yeah, is and i want you to spill the beans i'm super <laughs> <laughs> it's exclusive no it's uh you know it's exciting so i'm excited to and i think, you, I think you said it's uh an adult show is that correct yes adult animated show yeah uh-huh so, all right uh, adult animated show in space with aliens and cliffhangers and 10 uh -huh. episodes 
<laughs> yes. Yeah. For now. Yeah. <laughs> for now, for now. Well, that's awesome. Um, yeah. I mean, I think I, I think that's kind of everything I had to ask you. Um, oh, man. Uh, you know, I always wrap up these chats by asking what kind of advice you'd give to a student who's looking mm -hmm. to pursue a career in producing and creating shows, kind of like you have. So, uh, take it take it away. Whatever you have to share there, it'd be great. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, I guess my biggest advice was just to make things, make stuff, keep making stuff, um, and don't get too precious with things and. Um, um, one thing that's helped me is kind of set goals like every month or every year I do like, okay, this is what I want to accomplish by the end of the year. And then I even break it down to like, this is what I want to do. Set goals for monthly goals and then like weekly goals. And that's everything from work stuff to even my personal art and painting because I, I, li I like to do a lot of painting too. So I would just say uh, make stuff and uh draw get stuff out there and just keep going don't get too precious about stuff and uh and don't beat yourself up either and don't uh compare yourself to what other people are doing i know it's tough it's because, really uh, there's tough. a lot of amazing <laughs> artists and things down there and you can really get you can kind of get uh stifled by it but and it, it is good to kind of have you know a little bit of healthy competition or like oh i that guy or this you know, girl has this, got a show, what, you know, and how did that happen? You know, instead of that, just kind of focus on yourself and goals that you want to accomplish. And um, I wish I would have done more of that in my career. I, and I'm trying to do more of that. It's, uh, it's, it's easy to get tripped up in comparing yourself to other artists. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's yeah. a, that's a big point that you hit on there, especially, and you mentioned before too, the perfectionism, Mm -hmm. uh, as well, which is uh, something that I find personally and also other people who are artists really st struggle with. Oh, like, absolutely. Stop. <laughs> yeah, so. I know. You got to have deadlines. It's, um, it's, uh, it's hard. And if you can, you know, I know um, my uh, our head writer from Future Worm, Todd Casey, who uh, he teaches at CalArts. And one of the things he teaches, like, you know, storytelling and filmmaking and one one of the first things the first assignments he has the students do is like do a film in a week which is just is awesome because you just get thrown into like all right by the end of the week i have to have something and it just sort of forces you into it because it if you don't kind of set deadlines on yourself you know you're just gonna kind of wallow and <laughs> you know thinking stuff and you're just gonna be frustrated with no progress so the best you can try to yeah. set deadlines for yourself but uh but at the same time don't beat yourself up that's my that's my advice <laughs> be nice to really yourself nice. <laughs> yeah well, well that's thank you so much uh for joining me today ryan it's been a real pleasure and you've uh, shared a lot of great things about what you're working on and and uh, a lot of advice which i found really helpful and i hope cool. uh, our listeners do cool um, thanks now, Terry. We go, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Well, I was just gonna um, say this is this is great that you're doing this. I think this is a this is really cool. Like um, that you're putting together this podcast. I think it's a great. I would have loved it if I would have had access to podcasts like this because I listened to your other two and they were really they're great, very insightful, very helpful. Well, thank you. Uh, that's really good feedback for me to hear. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now, just before we go, I want to give our listeners a way to get in touch uh, with Ryan, and that is by checking out his website. Even though he said websites aren't uh, around too much anymore, <laughs> he's still <laughs> yeah. has one. It's ryanquincy.com. Uh, that's ryanquincy.com. Or you can follow him on Instagram at instagram.com slash ryanwquincy. And I'll be sharing the links in the description. All right, so that's all for now. Okay, bye.